Hello again, this is video 2 of Tuesday, January 22nd. You may be wondering why I'm sitting so low in my chair. And that's because the, uh, the camera, which I'm pointing to with my incredibly large finger right now, is going to be right below the text on the computer screen, right below, right behind my tablet. Um, just so that it doesn't look like I'm reading off a teleprompter. Or, as is more often the case, because <laughs> the, uh, the, the screen on my tablet is actually showing me as I'm talking to you, so I always have this, this tendency to look down at my face which I hope, I always feel like students will feel like I'm checking them out or something. But just remember, I can't see you at all. I'm, I'm checking myself out. How awkward now. <laughs> but instead of deleting that, I'm going to save that for pos posterity, because I'm sure that's healthy. Okay, so this is uh, the second lecture from today, and this is the, the content-heavy one where I'm, I'm actually going to be giving you some food for thought about how you should be um, defining the genre of poetry uh, for yourselves. Please make sure that you've... Um, listened to my previous lecture, uh, or, or watched my previous lecture, or checked out the transcript um, so that you have a little bit of context uh, for what I said about your Twitter conversation and where we go from here. Okay, so here we go. Uh, last Thursday I mentioned that one of the hardest things to hear about reading poetry is that it always helps to have read a lot of poetry in order to read the next poem well, as if reading poems was akin to joining a conversation between a lot of hipster name droppers, where the best thing that you could do is to nod as if you know what's going on and then make believe that you know, you understand the next thing coming out of their mouths. Or listening to a comedian from your parents' generation who refers constantly to trivias from the, trivia from the 70s, um, say Dennis Miller from the 90s. Not, not today, he's a little bit strange now. Uh, he's on Fox News all the time. But um, when he was on Saturday Night Live, those of you who know who I'm talking about, uh, he was a really esoteric comedian who would constantly bring up these things that I have to, have to think many people in his audience didn't know about. Um, or, I guess, if you know the game Trivial Pursuit, which is all about, you know, trivia questions, um, the 80s edition. If you played that, I'm sure it would just be really, really painful. Um, depending on who you are. I'm sorry, I don't mean to assume that all of my students are, in, like, 18 and probably born in 2006 or something. Like it, it, it's sad. Anywho, um, however, it's pretty much what you did to become a good listener of music, at least the music of your generation, which I know very little about, um... You may not remember it, but the first time you heard a song on the radio, or whatever it is the kids are listening to nowadays, you were probably a little at sea in terms of figuring out what was going on. But after gravitating toward what you liked best, and getting recommendations from your friends about similar music, or maybe surfing the internet to get some unconventional links to other music, uh, you became more or less a pro at listening to music, or at least being able to describe what you liked and why. Um, or take a different analogy, many people enjoy watching sports, and the more the better. Uh, my, my grandfather was like this. Um, he once admitted to me that he didn't really like baseball, but he thought it was important to watch it so that he could talk to people at the bar about it. Um, the first time you watch a sport with rules, and spoiler, all sports have rules, uh, you note that the players are obeying, or sometimes being penalized for not obeying, rules. But you don't know what they are. But you learn them. Or you stop watching sports, I guess. Or playing it. I still remember pretty vividly explaining to an old girlfriend of, girlfriend of mine the inappropriate touching penalty in, at co in college football when we were both at a game at the big house. Um, I, went, I did my undergrad at the University of Michigan, so that's a big stadium. Um, over 100,000 people. But anyway, uh, inappropriate touching. That's a flag. <laughs> anyway, it's not feasible to suggest studying all the rules of poetic genres before you attempt to read any poem, any more than it's practical to study the rule book of football before watching a game for the first time. You should just do it, with the knowledge that it gets easier with time. This is as opposed to, say, trying to bake a cake, which you probably should follow a recipe for. But somewhere in between baking a cake and, and uh, watching a football game is probably reading a poem. Um, because I do think that there, a little bit of preparation makes it better, but I don't think that you need to become an expert or write a PhD in order to read it, uh, the next poem. You should just keep reading also, we can make this into a trust exercise if you wish. I promise to tell you in advance when knowing more about a genre will aid you in interpreting a poem. But it's not just for me to do this. I also encourage anybody who already knows or suspects that they know an illusion or a generic resonance in one of our texts to tell the class about it on Twitter. As I mentioned last Thursday, poetry, in quotes, the genre, includes large subgenres like epic or narrative poetry or dramatic poetry. And some examples of epic are the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Dunciad, Paradise Lost, the Prelude, the Ring in the Book, Idols of the King, the Cantos, Changing Light at Sandover, and etc. They're still being written now. Usually it's the last thing that a poet does in their career as sort of a capstone. 
um, narrative poetry uh, has is less common. Um, some examples include, I don't know, Shelley's Alistair, uh, or Yeats's The Wanderings of Lushim. Uh, some people, I guess, might call the Bible depending on narrative poetry, depending on... Except for Song of Solomon, which is lyric. <laughs> and dramatic poetry, like most Renaissance plays, including those by Shakespeare, uh, Ben Jonson, Christopher Marlowe. Um, Shelley's Prometheus Unbound is another good, unstageable example, as is everything by Yeats, uh, uh, which are plays. I bring this up not because I'm planning to get you to read a lot of epics, <clears throat> or to make this into a Shakespeare class, but so that you do not confuse poetry with lyric poetry in the future, uh, because we'll be, we'll be reading mostly lyric poems, and I think a lot of people that say poetry actually mean the lyric without specifying that epic is also poetry. Right? And that would be like confusing music with country western music, which you shouldn't do. <laughs> and probably very few of you do. We'll be concentrating on lyric, as I say, which is short, related to music, and about which we can make some general assessments. Okay? So that's what the rest of this lecture is about. Uh, poetry is the oldest genre. It shows up in all cultures, whether or not that culture has a written language. We only know about the ones that have been written down, of course. Um, and it is, you know, sad to think about all the literature of, of some of these um, unwritten cultures that have not been preserved. Still, you can notice its traces within that culture. Um, scholars of Native American literature, for example, speak of what they call orature, which is, you know, like oratory plus literature. Uh, and those are usually just re referred to as the lost texts of the past. Uh, and you can still see how they influence, notion, they influence notions of authorship, uh, the narrative style of contemporary Native American authors, and so forth. Um, but we don't actually have the thing itself. We just have what we can infer about what it must have been like. Okay? Many of poetry's generic features, like rhythm, alliteration, we use the same sound over and over again, um, you know what rhythm is, and rhyme scheme, developed as a consequence of poet performers needing to compose and memorize and then recite their works for an audience all at once, often for their livelihood. You can think about someone actually like reading off the Iliad from memory uh, to see what an enormous task that would be and why you would need to have some you know, mnemonic devices or something to get you to remember what comes next. Um, and actually, this is, that's what happened for thousands of years. The Iliad, before it was written down in ancient Greece, was just memorized by some of these um, epic poet performers. Um, and when, when writing was actually borrowed from the Phoenicians, uh, the alphabet, the Greek alphabet was borrowed from the Phoenicians, um, I'm told uh, the Greeks um, thought to themselves, this is just going to be the end of culture because now no one's going to have any memory for these things. Anyway, um, but on the other hand, now we know about the Iliad, so probably it was worth it. Anyway, the, uh, I mentioned this about the, um, the performance aspect of poetry, uh, because it's probably how you should be thinking about some of these sometimes off-putting tactics like rhythm or rhyme. Um, and if you're thinking about the medieval troubadour, the, the traveling minstrel, um, then you probably know where I'm going next, which is to say that the lyric poem especially has a deep connection with music as an accompanying context. Many lyrics have refrains or rhyme schemes that recur in repetitive ways that are similar to refrains. And the term lyric itself derives from ancient Greek songs played on the lyre, which was a sort of simple harp with, I think, four strings, at religious festivals. We know them today as song lyrics, but the point I wish to emphasize is that we always think of parallel lines of thought with all of these examples. Words spoken by a performer, amplified by the voice and gestures of the performer. This is, by the way, the reason why I'm recording lectures rather than just giving you the transcript. Um, or the language of the poem, ritually emphasized by the harp string, or the words of the song lyric, given context by the tempo, beat, and melody of the song. So we can start to define poetry by noting that there is always a voice speaking to us, and that the content of what the voice says is always adjusted by the context the poem provides. Whether to amplify or diminish, to stress the sincerity of the emotion, or to give the reader cause to doubt it, to promote at least one alternative way of reading the utterance, that would not exist if the poem were delivered as a disembodied voice or as a paragraph of prose. For our purposes, we'll be really interested in finding visual cues to give context to lyrics, but I'll be teaching you briefly about all of them in Module 2. Um, regardless of your focus, poems provide all kinds of contexts to the reader, enough that the linguist and formalist critic Roman Jakobsen defined poetry as, quote, language inherently aware of itself, which I do find sympathetic as a definition. Um, but, you know, that's it's theory, so it's not as useful as if you unpack that, which I hope you'll do in your Twitter conversations. Um, another way that you can say it is to spin it as if, um, as many of you emphasized on Twitter, 
poetry is all about depicting emotional states. But if that's true, then we have to also admit that the emotion is conveyed by both the form and the content of the text. So th think of Adele, which I'm sure many, or many of you do anyway. Uh, I actually think her lyrics are really good, considering she writes them herself. She's incredibly mature for a 19 or 21 year old, depending on which album you're talking about. And she's writing songs in a foreign mode, right? She's British, and she's singing like Amy Winehouse in the genre of American soul music, uh, which is you know, African American. But would her songs work as well if there was no music? If you were just reading the, the text of her lyrics? No. It's, it's kind of an absurd question, um, right? You, but you, you kind of need her, uh, her, her deep, throaty, sometimes scratchy beltings out, you know, in order to, to believe it in the way that you, you need to in order to buy the song. Um, and I, I bring it up mostly because I, I want you also to admit that you need the lyrics in order for the song to be as good as it is, right? Um, Neuralink in the Deep wouldn't be anywhere near as powerful as if she was just saying dum de dum de dum de dum and humming along to the, to the music. Uh, I, again, an absurd example. But both of them together have to be true in order for the poem to be good. Um, here's another example. One of my favorite Beatles anecdotes is the story about how Paul McCartney always came up with his melodies first and then supplied words later. So the, the first time he played the song Yesterday uh, for John Lennon was with placeholder words. Um, and he, he would sing scrambled eggs... <laughs> yesterday is that it, and I don't know I, I always think it's kind of funny to think about what that song would have been like had they not had they kept the original title it makes me giggle to myself as you might imagine from this lecture um, look we, we all know songs with better music than words and vice versa but I think you'll probably agree with me that great songs have great lyrics and I would say to you that the best poems have discernible productive relationships between their form and their content and that's one way of, of, at least for me, that's one way of knowing when I found a good one. I can figure out what to say about it, and I can see the meaningful relationship between what is being said and how it is being said. Okay, one last thing. If it's true that poems have this intentional relationship between form and content, then it's also worth pointing out that they have a specific audience in mind. And by saying that, by stressing this audience, I, I'm not saying that the other big literary genres don't do this too. Essays, film, fiction, plays, they all have audiences too, but they certainly access those audiences in different ways. Rolling in the Deep, the Adele song, wants you to feel raw, unadulterated feelings of hurt and betrayal and a little bit of vengeance. It also expects you to know about soul music, so that you don't mistake Adele's passionate persona for a dangerously unhinged or suicidal individual. Other soul musicians... Shoot. Uh, hold on a second, my phone is ringing. Um... Other soul musicians also protect, project themselves into their music in a raw fashion. It's a feature of the genre, not a bug. The voice that speaks from within a poem is related to, but not identical to the artist. Adele admits in concert that she no longer feels like she wants to claw the eyes out of the guy who dumped her. But every time she sings the song, she makes you feel it. That's because, within the lyric poem, time has stopped. It's always that moment. Right? Adele herself, the, the real physical human being, has moved on. But the, um, the persona of the poet, the Adele that speaks to us every time that we, we listen to Rolling in the Deep, is always stuck in that one moment. That person, that voice, can't move beyond it, um, because the poem only records that one instant, okay? Um, we're we're going to keep talking more about lyric time, or lyric temporality, as I might call it, um, but I just wanted to mention it now here at the beginning, because if you're not used to thinking of lyric poems as discrete instance, uh, this can be a bit of a departure or something to get used to. Um, but again, keep thinking of the songs that you're used to singing, or sorry, well, singing perhaps to yourself, or listening to, you know, th those actually function much the same way, unless they're telling a story, in which case they're a narrative poem. All right, I would like you now, I would, I would like now to invite you to check out the uh, related screencast, uh, which for this lecture is going to be about a poem called Repression of War Experience by the World War I poet Siegfried Sassoon. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about that, but what, I, what I'm doing now is I'm going to be um, connecting lectures about content to like my analysis of certain poems that I, I won't have you read, but will be short enough so that they'll, they'll be relatable in the screencast. Um, the point here for today, at least, is to provide you with a, a sample analysis of how a poem's form and content can interrelate with one another.
to produce the speaker's psychology for its audience, um, which is then something that I'll encourage you to be practicing in your journals with the poems that I've assigned for this week. All right, thank you again for listening, and I will see you soon.